Okay, so we're going to talk about the post babel dispersion. Uh, and really, as a preface to this, I want to take you back to a course I studied in the University of Toronto in my PhD program. I basically uh, was coerced into this by my advisor to take a year long course in Mesopotamian archaeology, which was on the heels of his promise that I could instead devote those credits to an independent study in late Bronze Age archaeology of the Levant, where Israel is. So, because of his last minute uh, request slash requirement, I had to take the course. But I did so trusting that this was of the Lord. And there's almost not a day that goes by that I don't consciously thank him or think about how grateful I am that he allowed me to take that course. Because it really opened up my eyes to an area of archaeology that, as Christians, we often um, forget about or deprioritize when, in fact, the whole story of Israel is rooted first in Mesopotamia. So, because that's the birthplace of civilization, it's something that we should know about just as well, I think, as we know about the land of Israel itself. So, with that as a preface, uh, this is a... Um, Okay, this is a painting by an uh, unknown Flemish painter of the 16th century, and this gives you a window into his world, much more so probably than the world of ancient Babylon. Why? Well, in his world, buildings, especially taller buildings, were built in a circular fashion. So they conceived of the Tower of Babel being a series of circles that just go up and up and up and up. So... Um, Reality, of course, is going to prove to be much different because, again, the world of ancient Babel is very different than the world of the Flemish painter of the 16th century. So our goal is to try to understand what this tower is going to look like. Um, well, before we can focus on the tower and the city, we have to focus on uh, identifying this period arche archaeologically. And that, and for that, what we need to uh, draw our attention to is not um, the architecture, it's not uh, trying to find the city at first, but the very movement of people that can be traced archaeologically. Because you can't hide, archaeology cannot allow you to hide um, cultures of people, unless of course it's something like the nomads or semi-nomadic semi people who are wandering around in caravans use nothing but tents. But um, sedentary life, characterized by the building of communities, whether in small towns, villages, or, or large cities, um, it's going to leave behind a footprint. And when that footprint is examined, we can determine uh, a lot of things about those people. So um, as, as background, first we want to start with a biblical passage, going back to Genesis 11, 1 and 2. And then verse 4, and here's my translation. It says, Now all the earth had one language, and the words were common ones. Now that statement right there, it acts as an introduction to the events that are going to unfold. That's an introductory statement. All the earth had one language. It's, he's giving you background. And then he's saying, their words were common ones. So when they spoke to each other, they didn't have the problem of the language barrier that we have today. I just went to Israel. I couldn't communicate with a lot of the people who were visiting there because they spoke languages I could not speak. But this was a time when there was one universal language. And then, in light of that, he's going to begin the narrative now. And he says, So it came to pass with their moving from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they settled there. One misconception that Christians and even Christian scholars often carry with them as bad baggage is that all of the earth, humanity, had assembled at one place. I have news for you. That's a great idea, but the Bible never says that. It doesn't say they assembled in one place. It says that all, that all the earth had one language and their words were common ones. Then into the narrative... So it came to pass with their moving from the east that they found this plain. 
and it's just incidental information, important to the later narrative, but incidental information, that they all spoke the same language. There was one language. But it doesn't say they all assembled in one place. We often read things into the text, assume them to be true, and build a platform around it. And this is one of those cases where we, we make a mistake. So they came from the east, which means they moved westward from the east, an easterly direction. So being that the land of Shinar, as it says, is the land of Shumer in Akkadian, which we know as Sumer, and we know that to be in southern Mesopotamia, their point of origin had to be to the east of this. So probably it was actually to the north and the east. And that, that's typically how the biblical writers will talk, even as early as Moses. Um, later, uh, uh, invasions of, of Israel and of Jerusalem are talked about as from the east, when in fact they actually came from the north directly. But it's just that they came they traveled west first and then south. So that kind of description is used in the Bible of someone who comes from ultimately the west, but usually is attacking from north to south. And such is the case here probably with Mesopotamia. So it would have been to the, probably to the northeast of the southern part of Mesopotamia. Then they said, come let us build for ourselves a city and a tower or platform, either way in the Hebrew, with its top in the sky. And most English Bibles have the word heavens here. I don't like that word because the word heavens is confusing because it can either be talking about the abode of God or it can be talking about the deep, dark black of the cosmos, which we'll um, get into when we look at day one of creation uh, in another session. Or it could be talking about the bright blue sky that we see during the daytime as we look up, uh, such as now looking out the window. So... Um, so that there's not confusion, I think the best way to, to, to render the Hebrew word is to interpret it in its context and give the meaning that's, that's connected there. So its tower wasn't up in the abode of God. That's not the point. It's not that it was miles up in, you know, into the air or all the way into the, uh, you know, the, outside the atmosphere. That's not the point that the biblical writer is making. It's that he, they, they built this tower high into the sky. That's the point. And it's, a, it's made as a point because it was significant in its time. There wasn't something like this before that was built as high as this was. Now, if you look at the skyscrapers of today in Chicago or New York or, or Dubai, you know that those are really tall skyscrapers. There's no way that this structure at the Tower of Babel would have been anywhere approaching the height of a building such as that. So we can't get too caught up on how high was it. That's really not the point. The point is that it was higher than anything they had built before in their time. So it stood out, and it was a point worth making. So what's my historical observation then? The events of Genesis 11 are said to have occurred at the time when the earth had only one language. Since the historical period is defined by the advent of writing, that's when writing first came into existence, in the Jemdet Nasser period, and since writing's advent postdates the time when there was a universal language, the Tower of Babel was built in the prehistorical period. This is a really important presupposition. What am I saying? Within the ancient languages of the, of the, the ancient Near East, there is no attestation of one language in, among different peoples with different scripts. What does that tell us? That tells us that there, there was no written expression of a universal language. There are different languages with different syntaxes, different grammatical structures, different ways of communicating things, and different um, uh, words altogether. So what that tells us is that, the, is that the confusion of languages had to have taken place before writing came into existence. There's really no other possibility, a logical possibility. So that being the case, we need to look before the advent of writing for the time of the Tower of Babel. To conclude this observation, given that human migration originated from the east, historically known in biblical terms as the environs of Mesopotamia, somewhere to the east of Mesopotamia is the place from where they traveled. 
Clearly, they constructed a city and built a tower, a platform, that extended to some distance up into the sky. And of course, we don't worry at this point about how high that was. Also, by way of background, ancient Mesopotamian literature refers to a time when there was a universal language. You all know about how many ancient Near Eastern, especially Mesopotamian, stories of the flood that there were. Different heroes, uh, in some cases different um, facts in the narrative, how, you know, what took place, uh, what, what the flood hero did and what he didn't do, and what was the invo divine involvement. All of those are different versions of the same flood story but, of course, the inspired version ends up in the Bible in Genesis 6 through 8. Well, we also have ancient attestation to this universal language. So this is from En Merkar and the Lord of Arada. Down to the second paragraph of what I have for you, it says, In those days, the mountain lands of Shubur and Hamazai, the mountain of noble functions, Akkad, the mount mountain land resting in the meadows, the mountain land of the nomads, the people taken care of gave praise to Enlil, that's the god, the Mesopotamian god Enlil. How? In one tongue. That's how they gave praise, in one tongue. In those days, the contending lord, the contending prince, the contending king, Enti, and he's another important deity, he's the god of the freshwater Apsu, which we'll learn about this afternoon. The contending lord, the contending prince, the contending king, the lord of wisdom, the wise one of the country, the sage of the gods, he changed the language in their mouths. You see this? Ascribing credit to the changing of languages to this important God. Wow, amazing. As many as had been established, the language of each one of mankind being one. Thus, ancient sources clearly attest to a single language. It's not just the Bible here off on its own. And that's really helpful for um, undergirding the, the integrity of the biblical narrative. So this presents for us a perplexing question, especially in the line of archaeology. Well, if the beginning of Genesis 11 applies the world's first example of urbanism, and possibly even the first movement toward full-blown sedentarism, that's when you settle down permanently in one location. What does archaeology have to say about this major shift in societal patterns and movement toward urbanism? This question is especially important since we long have presupposed that the Babylon of the historical period is the same site as the city where the Tower of Babel was erected. So the point is this, and it's a question, the Babylon we know about, we see on maps, we know it's connected with Nebuchadnezzar and his great pride and his attack on the, uh, on the kingdom of Judah in the 6th century BC and his deportation of the Israelites into Babylon. All of that is, is centered around one major city. It's the Rome of its day, and that's Babylon of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. Well, is that Babylon the same Babylon same Babel as we read about in Genesis 11 in the Tower of Babel. And that's what we're going to solve in this session and the next. Answer. In the fourth millennium BC, remarkable changes took place in southern Mesopotamia, exceeding any expectations that might have been raised by the achievements of the Ubaid period, which is the one immediately before it. These innovations, which occurred in the Uruk and Jemdet Nasser periods, and the Jemdet Nasser period comes after Hebrew period, they constituted what has been called the urban revolution. So when does history tell us the urban revolution took place? In the Uruk period. That's what it tells us. That's what archaeology tells us. It screams loudly at us. That's when urban living began. You have a central ruler. You have a, an army to protect. You have a large population. You have mass production. You have, um, you have hired scribes. All of this, these are signs of urbanization. And this began in the Uruk period. So that was a quote from Michael Rofe, Mesopotamia and the Ancient Near East. 
So my comment is urbanism's origin is southern Mesopotamia, and the time period of its origin is the Uruk period. That, again, is what history tells us. This Babylon, uh, that is the Babylon we know about of Nebuchadnezzar's day, is located, though, in central Mesopotamia. Not at all the place where this urban revolution began, which was in southern Mesopotamia, the land known as Shumer in Akkadian, and pronounced Sumer by most people today. While the problem of an extremely high water table at this Babylon prohibits archaeologists from studying occupational periods there, earlier than the second millennium BC, surface surveys in and around Babylon have produced no ceramic or artificial, uh, artifactual evidence to suggest that this important city was even occupied during the Gemdet, uh, during the Uruk period, let alone the earlier Ubaid phase. This Babylon sprang up as a small town only during the Gemdet Nasser period, serving as a provincial capital during Ur III. That's hundreds of years later. And Ur III, in fact, that's when, when uh, Abram was on the earth, and he left Ur during the third dynasty of Ur, at the end of the third millennium BC. All of, the, uh, all of this begs the question of whether the Tower of Babel was located in southern Mesopotamia instead of central Mesopotamia of our Babylon. So, the, the city of Babylon, where Nebuchadnezzar ended up ruling, that city didn't have its origin until the Jemdet Nasser period. And then, it was just a small town. It wasn't even a large city. It was only during the Akkadian period, which, which follows the early dynastic period, that Babylon, that we know as Babylon, is built up and becomes great and an important capital city. So the Jemdet Nasser period, when it's a town, is the phase after the Uruk period when urbanism begins. You see how this works? So there's a problem with traditional Babylon as the Babel of Genesis 11. All right, back to the biblical text. Then he who is, that's the covenant name of God, scattered them from there, that's the Babel of that day, where, where this tower was built and the confusing of languages took place. He scattered them from there over the surface of the entire earth and they stopped building the city. So my observation is this, the end of the Tower of Babel narrative provides valuable information for studying the question of just where this city was located. Wherever the plain of Shinar and Babel were, from there, the inhabitants of that city were scattered throughout the known world when their language was confused and they no longer could communicate with one another orally. Okay, so as an archeologist, now, I can have something that I can sink my teeth into. Finding the place from where those people travel. Radical theories aside, such as Habermel's conviction that Babel is to be found in northeastern Syria, which is not a serious view whatsoever, scholars at least agree on the location of the Shinar Plain and Babel being somewhere in Mesopotamia. Once again, archaeology is posed with a vital question. Are there any clear indications of substantial migrations from Mesopotamia into other parts of the ancient Near East? Well, what history tells us is that there were only two such outward expansions or movements of people in the historical in the prehistorical period. So when I studied Mesopotamian archaeology for a year, one of the papers I wrote for my professor was to compare and contrast these two expansions, the Ubaid expansion and the Uruk expansion. I never mentioned the Bible in the paper because I wanted to pass the course. <laughs> I didn't want to fail the paper. But I figured this could be really instructive for me and maybe would shed light on this question of what movement of people can we connect to this outward expansion that the Bible talks about uh, when the languages were confused. So this gives you a... Um, a picture, a view, a, a chart of all of the different archaeological periods in ancient Mesopotamia's history. So I would call this conventional archaeological periodization. Emphasis on the word conventional. These are not my dates. These are the dates 
that are standard in the field. Um, you can get the PDF of this document. You, you know how I love my academia.edu webpage and love to sell that to you, which is free, of course. You can download it directly from there. I have a, a chart on the conventional um, archaeological periodization, and you can have your own PDF to go through. So, looking through these periods from the Middle Paleolithic all the way down, we come down to number six, that's the Ubaid period, right? Now, you can dispute the dating on all these periods. What you cannot dispute with any integrity is that they were each definable periods. That's, that is a problem you can't get around. Um, so down to that period, the Ubaid period, in the midst of the Ubaid period, there was this first outward expansion from Mesopotamia, and it was, you know, I'll let the rabbit out of the hat, it was from southern Mesopotamia. So that is a possible expansion we can connect to Genesis 11. We want to put it on trial, though. Well, there's a second outward expansion from southern Mesopotamia. That's the Uruk expansion that happens in the late Uruk period, the third subphase of the next major phase after the Ubaid period. And that expansion also becomes an automatic candidate for this um, post-Babel dispersion, because all of this is before the advent of writing. Why? If you look in red here, you can see that straight across from the Jemdet Nasser period is the official advent of writing. This is when the historical period starts. So these two outward expansions I've, um, of which I've made you aware are both prehistorical. So they both fit what we would expect from uh, you know, all that we read about in Genesis 11, where this, this confusion of language seems to have taken place before the advent of writing, because we have no examples of this universal language in any written script, and certainly we should have them in at least two or three uh, languages, if, that, if that's the case, or two or three scripts, but we have none. So, that being the case, now we're going to compare and contrast these two um, expansions and say, can one or the other qualify as the post babel dispersion? So first we look at the earlier of the two, the Ubaid expansion, and I'll once again let the cat out of the bag and give you a summary of this expansion and tell you that it is a peaceful migration and it's characterized by non-intrusive relocation. In short, to take away all the fun technical terms, they were nice to each other. Okay, that's how this one worked. Where did this, does this period uh, come? Where does this expansion come from? Again, southern Mesopotamia. Um, you see the arrow pointing to a site called Tel Al Ubaid. There are a number of sites that are clearly Ubaidian sites, such as Tel Al Ubaid, Eridu, Tel Ueli, Uruk, and Tel Uker. From those two, if you, if you really know Mesopotamian history, well, probably Eridu and Uruk, Uruk are the two cities that pop up at you, but there are other sites as well. Um, we call Tel al -Ubaid the type site for the Ubaid period because all sub-phases of this period are viewable, are discernible at the site of Tel al -Ubaid. So it becomes the site that kind of acts as a standard to judge and to uh, to compare other sites and see when they were occupied in relation to this clearly definable city of Tel Abu Bay. Some archaeologists and historians, such as Oates and Oates, have argued that both expansions can be explained, that is the Ubaid expansion and the Uruk expansion, can be explained as eras of Mesopotamian colonial expansion, right? We all know about colonialism, it's, it's now something that's frowned upon, it's taboo, it's, you don't do that anymore. The world will come down on you, if not social media, which is even more important. Um, while Stein and Osball have argued convincingly that each of these two dispersions had a fundamentally different expansionary dynamic, marked by strikingly different effects on the social identities of the indigenous groups who participated in these networks. So I am in agreement with, um, with uh, Stein and Osball that these are very different dynamics taking place with each of these expansions. The Ubaid expansion took place largely through the peaceful spread of an ideology, leading to the formation of numerous new indigenous identities that appropriated and transformed superficial elements of Ubaidian material culture 
into locally distinct expressions. Now you know how archaeologists talk. This is archaeology speak right here. Volumes of uh, interregional trade were low and population movements were minimal. So they were, th these were small groups of people, not large groups of people, small groups. Um, and this is much more than trade. This is the actual movement of people, and there's a difference between the two. Archaeology can, in many cases, distinguish between those two models. The material cultural assemblage, that is what they had in their hands, their pottery, their tools, their weapons, uh, their jewelry, everything that defined them culturally as who they were, that material cultural assemblage of the people from the Ubaid period includes brown painted and reduction fired ceramics made on a slow wheel, large baked clay nails, and highly distinctive conehead clay figurines. The Ubaidian houses had a characteristic tripartite form that's existing in three parts with a T-shaped cruciform or central room. The Ubaid period features the earliest appearance in Mesopotamia of clearly ritualistic public architecture. So now they're becoming more organized and more communal. In the form of standardized rectangular temples oriented to the cardinal points on the map and constructed with niched facades, buttresses, altars, and offering tables. So religiously, they're now beginning to express themselves in an organized way with a central location where the religious activity would take place and which could um, reflect their belief system. Well, what would you do with, with a niched facade? I mean, basically, a niched facade is a, is a wall. Let's say you had a, you know, a building that has four walls to it and, and one wall, and it's usually going to be in the back of the building. You push back part of that wall, kind of like this, and then straighten this, right? And, it, and that becomes a niche. And in that niche, usually you would put a cultic image. And that would be the god, for example, that is the patron god of the site or um, most important god in the pantheon you know, or, or whatever. So um, that, that began to, to, uh, to be a very important part of the culture of the people during the Ubaid period. The spread of, this Ubaidian, uh, of these Ubaidian peoples originated from a single identifiable southern Mesopotamian region to meaning outward or north in a northward direction to the northern peripheries, that's in northern Mesopotamia, mainly, eventually replacing the preceding or Halafian culture. And the Halafian culture is what was native to that area in northern Mesopotamia before the Ubanian people came from southern Mesopotamia. In the early uh, to mid-fifth millennium BC, according to conventional dating, the distributions of southern Ubaidian pottery, architectural styles, and other artifactual classes spread widely beyond the southern alluvium, forming a distinctive style that extended across an astonishing distance of 1,800 kilometers. From Cilicia on the Mediterranean coast of Turkey, across southeastern Anatolia, northern Syria, the Iraqi uh, Jazeera, and into southwestern Iran, and down the western shore of the Persian Gulf, into modern Saudi Arabia. So that's basically all of the main points on the compass people are going to, as far as 1,800 kilometers away. So you can see that this expansion was a significant one. It's not just that they moved around the block, they traveled a, a good distance. A contextual approach suggests that in most cases, obedient culture spread to these areas peacefully through some combination of trade and the local appropriation of Ubaidian societal identity and ceremonial ideology, rather than by actual colonization. So this wasn't colonizing, this wasn't invading and imposing your culture on another culture. It was, let's get together, let us join your community, you welcome us, and now we share together and have a reciprocal relationship, one that exists on a peaceful level. That's how it can be characterized. Moreover, Ubaidian styles of material, material culture spread gradually, not quickly, but gradually, and were selectively appropriated 
by northern communities. So it, it took a good deal of time before the local Halafian people accepted the cultural values and the styles and the, the methods of construction of different things of the people who moved from the south. So they kind of tested the waters and looked at how it worked and, you know, in different ways, uh, waited till they had a good feel for it, and then they adapted those slowly over time. And it probably worked both ways. The site of Tepe Gara in northern Iraq provides one of the best data sets with which to understand the nature of the Ubaid expansion. The site is a small two and a half hectare mound whose long stratigraphic sequence documents the transition from the Halaf period, also known as the pre-pottery Neolithic B period, to the Ubaid period. So it documents this transition. So let's look at the site of Tepe Gara, which is a Tigris site, that's the Tigris River, a site along the Tigris River to where these people um, moved from southern Mesopotamia. And you'll see here that it's on the, the north uh, eastern side of the Tigris River, a long ways from Tel Abu Bay, which is um, down here toward um, the Persian Gulf. In short, the public and domestic aspects of cultural identity at Tepe Gara seem to have changed at different rates. People quickly appropriated markers of Ubaidian identity in the public domain, especially in contexts relating to communal affiliation and hierarchical social status. Interestingly, the first markers of Halafian cultural identity to disappear at Tepe Gara and become replaced by their counterparts from the cities of, the, uh, of southern Mesopotamia, were Halafian ceramics and household items, both, re both reflecting communal affiliation as an aspect of public identity. So it was in the public realm where the changes were integrated the quickest, rather than the personal or the domestic realm. Similarly, larger, highly visible stone mace heads, badges of rank indicative of Ubadian public identity, also appear at a relatively early date in level 18. However, it is significant that the most persistent and longest lived Halafian artifacts, right, of the local people who there were there before the invaders came or the, those who moved to where they were, are smaller sized markers of personal identity such as seals, sewn on ornamental studs, and tanged pendants that they would wear. So the inhabitants of Tepe Gara retained a distinctively Halafian identity primarily in the private or domestic realm. The last items of southern, uh, southern Ubaidian material culture to be adopted at Tepe Gara were temple architecture and cultic artifacts related to religious ideology. So it's interesting that the religious realm is the one where the changes took the very longest to make. Why? Because of the, imp probably because of the importance of the native religious practices and thought and, 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 and ideas and deities and, and how they were worshipped there. So because of the importance of that to the souls and spirits of the people, it took the longest for change to take place in that avenue. The alien nature of this Ubadian ritual innovation suggests that the spread of Ubadian material culture was gradual and selective rather than a sudden and wholesale replacement expected of the traditional colonization model. Thus, this expansion was not a colonization. There's another site that's indicative of the uh, Ubaid expansion, and that's Digirmentepe. And this is located in eastern Anatolia, another site to where the Ubaidians traveled. And this is uh, along the Euphrates River, all the way up near the the mouth of the river itself, so you can see that it's it's even above Syria. It's that that far to the to the west, and then to the north, it's it's in the the outskirts of uh, of modern Turkey, ancient Anatolia. Well, in southern Mesopotamia and its vicinity, Ubadian culture, uh, Ubadian tripartite houses were built in a free-standing fashion. So down in the southern uh, Mesopotamian cities, the homeland of the Ubadian people. They um, ex architecturally expressed 
you know, their, their, their understanding of, of monumental architecture by building houses in a freestanding position, uh, fashion, so that the houses stood alone and had a gap or a separation between them. However, at the Girmentepe of distant eastern Anatolia, tripartite houses, that is, once the Ubadian people moved there and, and integrated with the locals, they were built contiguously in a pattern of adjacent houses with shared walls. This reflects a fundamental difference in the cultural construction and meaning of public and private space. So, uh, I, I relate this to, you know, when I grew up in, in northeastern Ohio, uh, there were no fences or walls between the houses of all the people. So, if I had a friend four or five doors over, I would just run through my yard and the next door neighbor's yard and the one after that through his yard, through all those yards, right to my friend's back porch and hop on his back porch and knock on his door and maybe even just go in without knocking if it was a really good friend, right? That's how I grew up in Ohio. When I was 18, I moved to Southern California and everybody had walls around their houses and their property and you, you couldn't just scale it, you know? I mean, you'd have to really work to get over that wall. And the whole goal, of course, was you stay in your yard and I'll stay in my yard. So there was a different cultural identity regarding public architecture and, and communal living between Ohio and California. It's not that one is inherently bad and one is inherently good. They're very, very different. So this is the idea here. Um, in, in the Obedian culture, it, down in the homeland, they wanted their space. So you would build your house with a decent amount of space between yourself and, and your next door neighbor. Well, up in the north, it was different. You know, they didn't have the same personal boundary issues. You know, you can be located right up against my wall. You put your wall on my wall and let's keep building. So that's the idea. So the, the Southern Obedians came up to the north. They didn't impose their style, their cultural value in this way, on the local people. But they simply adapted their way of uh, constructing ar uh, architecture according to the local model. So this is again a, a form of this, this peaceful coexistence and, a, and a, uh, a, a, a good working relationship between them all. Um, this redefinition of southern Ubadian tripartite buildings into a northern syntax at Degirmentepe represents a transformation of both the local and the foreign to create a hybridized identity rather than an Ubadian colonial imposition. So do you see how I'm throwing all this evidence at you to cause you to believe, listen, this was not an invasion. This was a peaceful migration where they were coexisting and getting along well. Then, sometime later in history, we come to the Uruk expansion. The Uruk expansion is very different. And once again, I'm going to tell you from the beginning, you know, if you don't like to read the end of the book first, which, which I don't, I apologize, but this expansion can be characterized as a colonial expansion all the way to intrusive um, invasion. And actually we see several different models and I'm going to show those to you. So again, it's the late Uruk period when the expansion takes place. So before that expansion happens, the, uh, the view on the, on the left for you here um, shows you, and you're looking at all the red dots of various sizes and different positions, especially comparing the north to the south, you're seeing where the population is greater. This is in the earlier root period and the middle of root period. And you will see that the populations were greater in the north than the south, weren't they? And that's probably because it was easier to live in the north rather than the south. The further south you went, the more desert-like the climate was, the more difficult it was to survive. So, of course, irrigation um, really comes into its own in the Uruk period, and that probably is one of the, fa of the numerous factors that cause the population to, to move itself um, during the, at least the first half of the Uruk period, the late Uruk period, into the south, rather than uh, concentrating so heavily in the north. 
So southern Mesopotamia really grew during the Uruk period as far as its population. This slide shows you a number of the uh, sites all across the ancient Near East where the material culture, uh, the most indicative form uh, in a certain type of ceramic, which I'll tell you about in a minute, where it spread all throughout the ancient world. So you can see the type site of Uruk down here, and everywhere you see these blue triangles, uh, and you're only seeing pretty much to the north and to the west, and a little bit to the east, but these are sites where they had beveled rim bowls uh, found in, in context where, again, this isn't trade, this is the movement of people outwardly from southern Mesopotamia. And this is just one aspect, one uh, feature of the, of the material culture. It's the most common, this bevel rim bowl that you'll see in a minute. So let's look further at the city that, uh, of Uruk, which becomes the type site for the entire Uruk period. So Uruk is located on the Euphrates River, and you're going to see for a moment um, where it was in the ancient most uh, times. Today, the Persian Gulf, um, the northern boundary of it is right in here, so it's a long ways away from the city of Uruk, but in ancient times, that was very different. You'll see that uh, momentarily. So this is basically a, a breakdown of the entire uh, uh, occupation at the city of Uruk that actually was inhabited all the way back into the Ubaid period, as, as early as Ubaid I. So this is similar to Tel Ubaid in that it features many of the same subphases that are uh, found at the at the type site for the for the Ubaid period. So um, Uruk was inhabited very early um, in, the, in the archaeological record, and then it's inhabited all the way down into the Jemdet Nasser period when we have the advent of writing, and it really boomed at that time. Then there's an obsolete phase, and then following that it was occupied again during the early dynastic one period. This is a picture of some of the devil rim bowls that you can find at sites where the Ubadian people uh, transplanted themselves to. Um, what's interesting is that the pottery that existed before this period was much more beautiful, much more intricate uh, and complex, and took a lot more effort and time to fashion than these bevel rim bowls. These are, these are known as ration bowls. So you're picturing now the beginning of urbanism and a city that is, well, what has blossomed into a city and it's become organized and has uh, public architecture. Um, it has to have. It has to be controlled through, through army or police force by whatever name. Uh, there's a sovereign who controls the city and has uh, administrative wings who handle accounting and, and everything else that has to go on in the life of the city. Well, with so many inhabitants, now you have the problem that. This is much more than a simple potter can keep up with because bowls break so easily and you know, jugs and so forth. So what they went to was mass production. Henry Ford would be extremely excited about the beveled rim bowls because he could make them so easily and in such great number um, and with rapidity. Um, this is a quick view of how they're made. If you look at the at lower um, example, you see that, there, that this is probably based on a mold, and you simply plop the clay into it, you fashion it, you take an instrument, you cut it off at the top, and you go to the next one. You, you prepare them all, you fire them in the kiln, and away you go, you now have you know, 50 beveled rim bowls that you can pass out to all the new people who've come to your city, or the ones who were born to those who now are expanding the size of their families. Even in the, uh, in the West, in the Levant, you have um, examples of imitation of the bevel rim bowl, such as were fashioned by in, in stone with basalt, and basalt is an important uh, uh, stone that's, that's used in many contexts in many sites throughout uh, Palestine, throughout, throughout Israel. And at this time, they copied 
the bevel rim bowl and, and simply made their own bowls out of stone that were very similar in fashion. Another um, form of pottery that's very indicative of the um, Rook expansion, the later Rook period, is the drooping spouted jar. Um, it's known as a beer jar. If you don't like alcohol, I apologize, but that's just the way it was. Uh, before this, in the middle of the Rook period, and then even in the, in the early Rook period, you had um, jars that, and if you look in the upper left photo here, you'll see jars that were straight spouted. Well, when it came time for beer jars, they figured out that the alcohol was going bad too quickly because of exposure to the elements in the air that would compromise it. So what they, did, what they technologically determined was that if you make the spout drooping, then you prevent those, those um, gases from getting, seeping into the container and contaminating it and causing the beer to go bad so quickly. So just drooping the spout uh, improved this, um, and improved the longevity of, of the beer that was in the jar. So these kinds of jars were in vogue at the moment that the post uh, that the Uruk expansion took place, and they were spread throughout the ancient world. Well, what are the characteristics of the Uruk expansion? The fourth millennium BC Urukian assemblage represents a second transplanted Mesopotamian cultural style, which was dis distributed even more widely than that of the Ubaid expansion. So, as far as the Ubaid expansion went, picture the Uruk expansion as going much further even still. Sites recognized as Arukian colonies have been identified across a vast area along key trading routes from Hasek Kuyuk in the Turkish upper Euphrates across northern Syria and northern Iraq all the way to the Zagros Mountains to the east. Arukian material culture also found its way to outlying areas in the northern Levant, that's further than the Uvaid expansion had gone, and even down into Egypt. And what's been found in Egypt is just the tip of the iceberg. They've barely even uncovered all that really uh, is there. The colonies of the Uruk expansion are quite distinctive as intrusive sites, established rapidly in the midst of local Iranian, Syrian, and southeastern Anatolian cultures, especially. At these sites, the full range of Urukian material culture appeared suddenly in the archaeological record, a pattern quite different than that from the Ubaid expansion. This includes ceramics, architecture, and the entire repertoire of administrative artifacts, such as cylinder seals, boule, tokens, and clay tablets with inscriptions used to monitor the circulation of goods. Also, culturally specific aspects of technological style, such as dimensions of bricks and bricklaying patterns, match exactly the practices in the southern Mesopotamian homeland. In some, in some cases, colonies were founded from scratch on uninhabited land. In other words, where there was virgin soil, that's where they built a colony. This is not the model that happened in the Ubaid expansion. In many outlying areas, Urukian colonies took the form of small trading enclaves within pre-existing indigenous settlements and some of which the immigrants lived in segregated communities separate from the locals. At least one site, and we'll look at it, a full-blown invasion took place. So, um, you've seen a map with some of the bevel, uh, sites where bevel rim bowls were. Now looking further to the west on the Mediterranean coast and, and more, a little bit into Turkey and, and uh, Egypt, you see a number of the sites that had one or another expression of this uh, material culture from, um, from southern Mesopotamia that transpired during this Urukian expansion. So there are beveled rim bowls, conical bowls, globular jars, um, there were drooping spouted jars, there were four lug jars, um, there were expressions of monumental architecture, such as the tripartite buildings of southern Mesopotamia made their way to the, to the west, to the Levant, during the time of the um, Uruk expansion. And later, those were the precursors, that model, I should say, the three-room house, was the precursor to, to what we know of in Israelite uh, culture as the four-room house that 
signals that this is probably Israelite people during the period of the Israelite monarchy. All of that is based on this expansion that took place many uh, phases earlier archaeologically in this Uruk expansion when the Levant was literally absorbed um, by this culture from Mesopotamia. So uh, let's look at a few sites. First, Habuba Kabira. Well, this was a colony that was built on virgin soil by transplanted people from the Uruk expansion. Habuba Kabira is located um, far to the northwest of Uruk and southern Mesopotamia. You can see it here on the western side of the, the Euphrates River, just to the east of the Mediterranean Sea and the Amuk Plain. That's in uh, ancient Syria. So this is technically part of ancient Syria. Well, um, just a little cultural context here. The late Uruk period in Mesopotamia has an equivalent in the Levant. And it's, there are different names for the archaeological periods because of the fact that they're completely different places. In the Levant, it's known as the Chalcolithic Age. And the late Chalcolithic V period is equivalent to the late Uruk period. So if you want to see how this outward movement of people is taking place in the Levant, what you want to look for is a site that has a settlement from the period known as Late Chalcolithic V. Well, the Late Chalcolithic uh, one to three periods in northern Mesopotamia and beyond are considered a time of pre-contact. In other words, it's before the Mesopotamians really had a strong contact with the people from the Levant. Um, there are exceptions to the rule, of course. Um, but conversely, the late Chalcolithic IV period began the time of contact. So now in the, in the, four, the Chalcolithic IV period, they were really starting to have uh, sustained contact. And in the, in the fifth period, that's when it's, a, it's characterized, late Chalcolithic, Chalcolithic V period, that's characterized by an actual um, uh, expansion and, and, and strong ties between the two. So you can see that in this chart. The site of Habuba Kabira had a dense occupation with well-organized architecture and a planned layout over its 18 hectares. The site was built on virgin soil, thus certainly not previously inhabited before its construction in LC5. Its features include planned city quarters, tripartite buildings, and Urupian temples. Here you can see um, a larger map on top showing where the site is um, in relation to its local vicinity, and you can see some of the topography there. Uh, the close-up below shows you the part that was the main occupational area of the site of Hububa Kabira, complete with most of its, um, in the top center here, most of the public um, and, and, uh, um, uh, and uh, communal buildings and, and residential buildings, as well as over here. And to our far left, you can see some tripartite temples of large scale that show a central point to where the, uh, where the religious activity took place um, cultically at the site. This is a, an artist's reconstruction of what that would have looked like. You can see that it was a large colony, well-established, a lot of people, and they were, um, they were on their own. They did not uh, have cultural ties with the Syrian people around them. They did not interact well or um, trade much with the, the people in the vicinity. They were a site um, almost completely on an island, standing alone. Well, here's a quote from um, Oates in Trade and Power in the 5th and 4th millennia BC. They say, at both sites, that is Ububa Kabira and Jebel Aruda, not only the material culture, such as pottery, seals, and ceilings, but also the individual residential units are indistinguishable from those of southern Mesopotamia. In other words, the people who moved there didn't adapt their own styles or um, methods to that which was local to Syria. It maintained the way it was in their homeland of southern Mesopotamia. 
and in particular at the site of Uruk. The identity of material culture, ideology, accounting practices, use of space, and building techniques render inconceivable any interpretation other than that the settlements at both Habuba Kabira and Jebel Aruda were built and lived in by southern Mesopotamian people. Both settlements were short-lived, about 100 to 150 years, it's, it's thought, if not shorter. Both were abruptly abandoned. The construction of a massive city wall in the second building phase suggests that local relations may not have been entirely peaceful. You didn't see the construction of city walls in the Ubaidian expansion, but during the expansion under the Uruk period, city walls were made for defensible purposes. Urukian colonies such as Abuba Kabira and Sheikh Hassan were large, fortified settlements that apparently used coercion to control the local Syrian communities around them. In other words, the immigrants from southern Mesopotamia established a strong foothold at these Syrian sites, built defensible fortifications, then began to impose their will on the native Syrians who had been residing in these areas. And this is a little bit of a picture of some of the material culture. Here you see the drooping spouted jar to our upper left, the top left in this room. Um, you see some four lug jars to the right, in one in dark red, and then one to the left of it. Um, and you see some uh, yeah, other forms of pottery that are indicative of the uh, late Uruk period. So we have drooping spouted jars, we have bevel rim bowls, we have red slip lug jars, we have standard four lug jars, all of the expressions of material culture from southern Mesopotamia were found at Habuba Kabira. And even their, their architecture uh, was, was, uh, was copied as we see here in the um, tripartite building to the left, part of which you can see in the photo to the right. Uh, in addition, they had, and we'll look at this uh, this afternoon a little bit more closely, another uh, characteristic feature of the Ubaid culture, or uh, the Uruk culture, that found its way into the places where their colonies settled, was stone mosaic or clay mosaic um, buildings. And so this was a, um, a beautification. Uh, this, this allowed their structures to be built and then beautified with a facade um, to make it look much uh, more attractive. So pillars or, or, um, or parts of walls, for example, were coated with, this, uh, with these um, cones that were colored and formed a very, a very eye-pleasing design. So these also are found at Habuba Kabira, as well as sites down in Uruk and other cities in southern Mesopotamia. And here is what it would have looked like with some of the stone mosaic cones in, the, in their positions um, uh, in a building at Hububa Kibera. Then we come to some uh, more unpleasant items of the material culture, these, these uh, sling bullets that were made of various materials and various sizes, uh, these primarily being unfired clay. And you can see in the depiction on the right, much later in history, way later in history, you see a picture of, uh, on a that's from a relief of some Neo-Syrians um, firing their sling ball with their slingshots and using them in war. So it, it wasn't just, you know, kids something for kids to play with to hit each other with, you know, some round piece of gum or something. This, these were large projectiles intended to hit someone in the head, ideally, to knock them out and render them unconscious. Okay, one more site, um, uh, Hasinebe Tepe. This was a segregated colony of the Uruk expansion. You can see that it's located just to the north of Huluba Kabira. And here, the southeastern Anatolian site of Hasinebe Tepe experienced trading contact with southern Mesopotamia during the middle Uruk period. By some time in the pre-contact phase, that's late Cal Calculific III in the Levant, the town had large-scale public architecture, but the population and power base remained indigenous throughout the conquest period. We have, uh, quote unquote, we have absolutely no evidence for fortifications, weapons, warfare, or violent destruction in the contact phase B2 settlement. 
The Lane Roof uh, city of Hassan and Vitepe, though, featured two distinct neighborhoods, one being a settlement of native residents measuring 3.2 hectares, and the other being an Urukian en enclave measuring a half of a hectare and having been built over an earlier indigenous sector. Thus, at Hasanepi Tepe, we seem to have um, a evidence of one of the world's oldest examples of an ethnically, ethnically segregated city. Uh, you know, you think of what happened when different people groups migrated to the United States. They were Irish, they were Polish, they were uh, Romanian, they were my Serbian people. What happened? Did they all go and settle and immediately integrate themselves into the local cultures that were there in the United States? No. They went to places like New York City, Boston, Philadelphia, etc., and they made their own segregated communities. So what do we have here at Hasinepi Tepe? Probably the world's oldest form of segregated living. So they didn't even connect with uh, the, the other people who were there. In fact, they had separate trash heaps from one enclave to the next, even though they were in such close proximity to one another. There's no evidence for either Uruk colonial domination or warfare between the colonists and the native inhabitants Instead, the presence of both Anatolian and Mesopotamian seal impressions at the site best fits a pattern of peaceful exchange between the two groups. Comparative analyses of ceramics uh, and so forth uh, from Mesopotamian and local parts of Hasinepe Tepe suggest that the Uruk conclave was a socially and economically autonomous diaspora whose members raised their own food, produced their own crafts, administrated their own en encapsulated or circumscribed exchange system. In many cases, both Uruk and local ceramics occur together in the same contact phase deposits, but it's also common to see remarkable contrast between contexts consisting of local Anatolian types, whereas contemporaneous, uh, contemporaneous deposits nearby yielded almost exclusively Urukian Mesopotamian ceramics. As well, Uruk ceramics and local Anatolian ceramics were being used and then discarded separately. The final site to look at is Hamukar, where there was an invasion um, by the Urukian people. Hamukar is located to the, um, to the east and the south of Hasinepi Tepe, and it's actually in part of Mesopotamia, again, far in the north. It's actually not um, too far from Tepe Gara. Well, the northern Mesopotamian site of Tel Hamukar has a main mound and a southern extension. The final late Calcolithic city of LC5 had a defensive wall. Once again, when is the defensive wall uh, found? Late Calcolithic 5 equal to late um, Uruk period in Mesopotamia. It surrounded its perimeter with large parts of which that were visible with, uh, already have been found to be visible with satellite technology. The architecture of the LC5 city features tripartite buildings, courtyards, lockable doors on storage units, protection, right? And ceilings indicative of Southern Mesopotamian culture. How did this culture gain its foothold at Hamukar? According to Clemens Reichel, who excavated there, the chief excavator, Hamukar experienced a violent conflagration, that is a destruction by fire, around 3500 BC, according to him, the very time period of the Uruk expansion. The Urukian invaders destroyed much of the city in a hostile invasion and es established an intrusive culture of their own at the site. In other words, they took over completely after killing all the inhabitants. Evidence of this invasion, which mitigates against the prevailing theory among archaeologists who say that the Uruk expansion was a peaceful movement, includes a burn layer, collapsed door jams, intrusive pits with bevel rim bowls, skeletal remains of native residents killed during the invasion, and sling bowls found in both whole form and smash from impact. And the smashed ones we call Hershey Kisses because they look exactly like a Hershey's Kiss after they've hit a hard wall or something and missed their target, but instead hit something that was much harder than they were. So here's tripartite houses from Hamukar, 
Here's a tripartite building with those niches that are built into a wall, probably for um, the uh, mounting of a, a cultic figure. Here are the sling balls, and you can see an actual Hershey's Kiss in, the, in B here on the upper left, um, caused by a sling ball that hit a target that was probably something like a residential wall. So um, these are some of the larger sling balls, the round ones uh, that were used in the invasion. And then some of those sling balls were found in context uh, together in an area that made it look like this was a stockpile of, of weapons and, and ammunition. Um, and clay balls were, or clay, clay bullets were also found near um, body parts, near skeletal remains such as this skull. So here's a human casualty from the battle for Hamukar that was won by the invaders. And uh, that pretty much brings us to the end. So rather than going through the conclusions, I'll leave it at that.